And then we was just like, bro, like, how are we going to get SoundCloud, you know, reposts and whatnot? Yeah. I know these things exist, but I can't afford them. So what am I supposed to do? Because working a job like I was working wasn't paying enough. Like these things, the underground things, they cost money, but they, are, they work and they're real. Yeah. But you got to have money to do it. So then I was like, all right, let me start a business. And then when I started the business, it actually just started to take off. And then I was like, well, damn, let me just focus my attention on the business now because it's making a lot of money. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brian Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is No Labels Necessary. We like to speak with people who are doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And today we got Justin P. Yes, here sir. with us. This man has built a brand, a merch brand, sold over $10 million in a three-year span. He went up about 750K followers on IG in four Sorry. months. He dudes all around finessing, but but winning <laughs> at the same time. And, you know, if in this journey, though, there's obviously a lot of, like, lessons. Sometimes you success, you, you move too fast, you yeah. grow, and Justin's going to share a lot of those gems from from that as well. So, Stay tuned, man. This is about to be an interesting one. I'm ready oh, yeah. for this talk, man. I'm, I'm excited for this talk. Justin, appreciate you stopping by, my guy. More than a pleasure. I really appreciate y'all for letting I me come on the show. Man. Yeah, it's, it's really dope to see, like, you where you are. Because we, we touched on it already, like how we first connected off of Tweet Decks and stuff. I don't know if you would remember right. Tweet Decks, man. You were the one who put me on that game. <laughs> and... And it, I mean, like, and I and I got into it for right. a while. You sent me down that <laughs> rabbit hole. It was all kind of stuff. So let's start there, actually, bro. Yeah. What what were you into, bro? Because <laughs> you put me down a rabbit hole. I feel like you put me on like another app, maybe like a Who Telegram knows? or something. Oh it was, man, yeah, yeah, you had me on all kind of yeah. like I don't know, dark it, web or underground type pages. Yeah, and stuff. I call it like the black market. You yeah, know? Like, yeah. So basically, when I was coming up in the game on just in social media you can like if you got into the right group chat with the right boys you know what i'm saying like 15 16 year olds the thing is, is that they own all of the media like yeah. you know yeah. these like these little one of my little white homies like carter or jake is like owns 10 million followers or 100 million followers on the gram and then i remember being in these group chats and then like an executive from like universal or like something will come in there and be like yo we working on this new artist Khalid or we working on this new artist Bryson Tiller this is the song we pushing we need the memes to go up and then they'll wire Carter or somebody 40k and then all of a sudden next week you just see nothing but memes of don't Bryson Tiller out mm -hmm. so being in the back end of that because that's like the world that I came in when I saw you doing your thing on just like developing artists and you know mm -hmm. the promotion and stuff like that I was like I wonder if you know about all of these things because you knew some things that I didn't know and I knew some things that you didn't know yeah. and I was like all right let's just see if we can have a conversation yeah. but that's kind of the world that I came from where it's like the tweet decks like forcing snapchat views and you know like all just all of this stuff bro like yeah. and is, there's really a world out there that people don't understand that you know exists where you can pay to get as pretty much as much promotion as you want oh, that is to, legit we try to let them know <laughs> that's legit yeah, we try to let so, them know yeah <laughs> and and that's the part about it though is it's it's legit actually right yeah. right we're not even talking about like any type of payola for you know, the Spotify's and things like that. Right. But this is just, hey, I mean, everybody pays for influencers supposed to get on IG pages and things like that. Yeah. There's just, there are some ways to optimize doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then now, so it's funny that you say that that was like, you know, our first conversations because then I seen, you know, you doing your thing on your side too now where yeah. it's like, big doing big projects for big artists yeah. and like really killing the game millions and millions of tiktok views and stuff like that i'm like and then obviously a lot more than that but yeah. it was like bro that's crazy like where yeah. we both started from to like where it's at now it's, it's interesting man but you know keeping it on you of course <laughs> <laughs> what got you in that world yeah um that's a good question oh you know what it's because i started to throw parties when i was younger mm -hmm. so I was uh, in high school, we was throwing parties, and then I remember when that's when I first learned about tweet decks because it was like, I was like, bro, it's gotta be a way for me to tweet about my party, and then if I got access to everybody else's Twitter, like I can make them tweet stuff I need them to tweet about my party too. So back in the day, we used to use it as get all of the popular girls and guys 
get access to their Twitter by getting their password and be like, I'll let you in a party for free. Just let me like promote a little bit. I'm only going to tweet X, y, X amount of times. And then we'll just promote the party and then we make a ton of money from it. And then I was like, all right, but if you can tweet from their page too, then maybe you can like retweet and all of these other things. So the way I started to switch it was now get all of the most popular people on the internet in general and just get them into your, your group, your tweet deck. And then now it's just charging people to like, retweet their tweets and then every tweet i was tweeting retweet all of my own tweets two thousand three thousand retweets on everything growing our following really quickly and then from there that was just the start it was like trying to just figure out how i can optimize the business more and then just mm -hmm. taking it to the next level and then realizing while i was doing that figuring out myself there was a little a whole world that already existed that i obviously belonged in and i just kind of found my way man yeah, it's crazy man. it's random bro i love it man it's random i love it though we gotta take a quick second because we have some big news. If you like the marketing, branding, and music talk that we do in our content, you have an opportunity to meet with us in person and get the real deal information about how we are currently moving in the music industry, blowing up artists that we can't put online. So if you wanna see myself, Sean, J.R. McKee, give you marketing, content, and branding advice that's absolutely guaranteed to help you move your career forward, then you wanna make sure you check into this event it's going to be super exclusive. We're only letting in 60 people, not 61, not 62. So if you don't make it, then you know your best bet is to hope that we do another one. So if you want to make sure that you're one of those 60 people, go to nolabelsnecessary.com or check the link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. And yeah, hopefully we see you there. You mentioned something I didn't know right before we hopped on that you, you had an artist bag as well for yourself. Yeah. But you saw what a lot of people see. Right, yo, I gotta, I gotta make some money, mm -hmm. right? And what was the first thing? Were the parties the way you were like, I need to make money, or was that just for fun? Or like, what was the thing when you were like, I need to make money if I even want to think about doing any type of artist? Yeah, type thing? it was really just in the beginning because I remember sitting down with like my homie. He would help me write songs and stuff, and then my other brother, like my boy, we would just like, he would just help me like promote stuff. You know, you got your friend group that help you do your thing, and then we was just like, bro, like. How are we going to get, you know, because at the time you could even pay for Spotify. I mean, uh, it's not Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, you know, repost and whatnot. Yeah. I'm like, bro, but how are we going to pay? I know these things exist, but I can't afford them because mm -hmm. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do? So that's when we were just like, all right. I was like, if I want to do this, I got to start some sort of business or something to make some money because working a job like I was working wasn't paying enough to Bro, these like these things, like underground things, they cost money, but they're they work and they're real. But yeah. you got to have money to do it. So then I was like, all right, let me start a business. And then when I started the business, it actually just started to take off. And then I was like, well, damn, let me just focus my attention on the business now because it's making a lot of money. And then that was kind of my you know transition from starting off as an artist, one to make money, and then making money, and then being like, all right, well, let me focus my attention on the uh, on the business side because that's that's an art of its own as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you haven't went back and tried again? No, nah, not really. But the <laughs> way that we're doing it now is we kind of coin in the term we feel like it's like edutainment. So it's like most people are like just entertainers and it's like obviously not as positive most of the time. Yeah. And then a lot of people are just educators. So it's just like you bore me to death with this information. But it's good game, but like it's not very, you know, it's not industry standard. So we've been finding ways to how can you make like if I release a course or an ebook or something, make it look like Travis Scott just dropped, you know, the new Cactus Jack collection. So we've been like playing with ways of like how can you legitimately be fifty percent entertainment and 50% education. So now you can dress up the education to look like entertainment and then make the education really, or excuse me, make the be entertaining as well when you're educating too. So like we've been kind of in that mix trying to figure it out. How do you do that for real, for real, man? Because that there, there's a lot of people that are entertaining and they try to play with some of the artists look, mm -hmm. but then the information really isn't there. Right. And at first, they're winning because a lot of people who don't have much information, they'll follow them. Right? right. But then when it really comes down to it, after a few years, you start seeing people pop up and you realize, yeah, these people aren't really teaching much. Yeah. Right. They don't really know much. They're figuring out as they go. Obviously, you've done some things in business, so you have something to stand on. Right. And I think that's a huge benefit, right, coming into it. Right. right. You have a different perspective. But what have you seen in terms of that, that half and half value? Yeah. 
I mean, the good thing about it is that I think you can do it either way because the way I look at it is like, you know, look at look at a Nipsey, right? Nipsey comes in the game, a great rapper, like, mm-hmm. and obviously just a generational talent and all of those things. And then he gets so popular with his entertainment that he flows into the educational side, starts educating, starts getting into crypto and all of these things. And it's seamless because he did it in his own way. Like he had his own brand when he did it. Whereas I feel like I'm doing it almost backwards where it's like, I built the business, I showed what I what I did, and this is what it is, and then now utilizing those funds that are available now to then transition into becoming more so on the entertainment side. But you have to toe a very like very close line because you can't be corny when you do it too mm-hmm. because that's the biggest side that the entertainment has is like you just look live when you're doing it. So now it's like the mo- the biggest piece of it, figuring it out, is how to make it not look corny because that's when you have like people that are big YouTubers, then they become rappers, but then it's like, yeah, you kind of still corny though, bro. Like, yeah. so, but then you have some talents that do transition where a Cardi B is on Love and Hip Hop and then transitions to one of the biggest artists that like out. Yeah. So there's a line there that has to be towed, and that's kind of what we're, we're taking our time with it. But I feel like I came in a good time because. Now I got the capital behind me, and then I have time to actually, like, work on the transition as I go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you talked about a brand taking off. We got to get right back to that. Support black colleges. Yeah. Right? Just like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go start this business to try to, like, fund a career, and then you end (laughs) up starting something that takes off. How does that idea come about? Yeah. So I went to Howard University Mm -hmm. uh, over in the East Coast, so crazy school you know dope (laughs) hbcu um so when i went there i i went there based off of the merit of my barber like i was getting my hair cut and it was actually like my replacement barber so you know you walk in the in the barber shop and then you looking around like where my barber at and then the dude next to him's like yeah i get you bro like i got you and he's like "Eh." like (laughs) where where my guy at you know i was getting my hair cut by that guy and then he was like yo what schools you get accepted to i was like baylor um university of north texas and howard and he was like whichever one's not in texas just go there and i was like all right so then i just went didn't know about a fraternity sorority hbcu nothing none of my family i was first person my family to go to college so then when i got there and i saw like Bro, just how beautiful uh, HBCU campus is and seeing excellence and black people that were smart and all of these things. And then going into the cafeteria and this fried chicken Fridays and, you know, what I'm saying and they throwing <laughs> parties in the cafeteria on Saturdays. I'm like, this is this is great. Yeah. So then I was just like, well, if I didn't know about that, how many millions of other black kids don't know about this? So we were just always into fashion. So we was like, all right, we're going to try to tell the story of these HBCUs because, um, like Barnes and Noble owns most of the HBCU bookstores and that's where most of the merchandise is selling. So I was like, how can we tell our own story through the fashion and make it look cool for us? And then I think we were just like one of the first to to do it and do it in that way. But that's kind of how it all started. It was just like going to school, realizing that, you know, this needs to be out there. And then we was just going to market it in the way we knew how, which was clothes. That was crazy. I was going to a HBCU when y'all first popped off, and like how fast everything spread was actually crazy. Oh, what school did you go to? Hampton. Oh yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, bro. That's why when you said, I was like, oh. yeah, uh, <laughs> hey, look, it ain't no smoke now. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was cool like watching it from the ground because I remember being at like a might have been an HUSU homecoming and like uh-huh. seeing like one or two shirts, and then like a month later, like everybody I knew had one. Yeah, yeah, it was like really fast. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Like, do you feel like a large part of that had to do with, I guess the the messaging of it, just like, because support black college right. is a very it's clear. strong statement to stand behind. So, like, you attribute a lot of it to, like, just good messaging? I think that it was a few things. Right. It was um, it was the messaging. It was the timing. And then it was a little bit of luck, bro. Um, and then also it was, like, just the business acumen. So, the messaging was very clear. That helped us out a ton. The timing, a lot of police brutality, a lot of, you know, yeah. black people yeah. being taken advantage of, et cetera. And then uh, having a, a brand that, a message you can stand behind while all, the things, all those things were going on. And then it was all of the, the business acumen that I already had coming into it. So, it was, like... Um, Influencer marketing, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, um, grassroots marketing, selling at all of these homecomings, and then content creation, content curation. So it was a mixture of all of those things, and then you sprinkle on, like, some favor and some grace, and then it was just like, you know, it worked out, you know. Yeah, okay, okay. 
So that was yeah, that was that was it. But I mean, it was really it was a really quick um like it was it was pretty quick. Like like I said, the brand started in 2012. And then, but I wasn't a part of the brand. Like my business partner and his cousin started it. And then in 2018, like after we graduated, I came in because I had got a job doing digital marketing. And I was like, this should be doing multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. But it wasn't. It was like doing like 1500 a month or something. And then I was like, let me apply all the stuff that I learned from my job into this business. And that was the business acumen side. And then the rest of it was timing, messaging, and those other things. What was one of the first things that you said? I need to do here to help this brand start moving. Yeah, it was those four things. It was first we started doing paid ads because I was just like, I mean, mind you, this was 2018. So like now it's a little bit more difficult to, yeah. to get right, but it's, you can still do it. Um, but back then, you know, we put in a dollar, you know what I'm saying, getting like four or five dollars back. So that was that helped us scale really quickly. Excuse me. And then we were able to. I was able to like look at things that were happening uh, as far as like increasing the average order value and increasing the conversion rate. So we were able to tweak a few things where most people are like, all right, if I'm making money by putting money in, let me put more money in where I was like, all right, we're making money, putting money in. Let's tweak the thing that we're putting money into so that we can make more money on the front end. So we were changing things that were free to us to make. But if you change, if you boost the conversion rate from 1% to 2%, now you've doubled the business for absolutely free. Mm -hmm. But then you're able to put way more money on the front end because you'll, and you'll make a lot more. So um, the, that was number one, paid ads, and then like conversion rate optimization stuff. Then you have influencer marketing. Bro, we were sending 10 to 15 DMs an hour, every hour. And we were just like, hey, are you offering any paid promotional opportunities? And we didn't, we didn't want to pay them. But when they saw the message and they saw what we were doing, they're like, oh, no, nah, bro, just send me some stuff. So then you send out stuff to enough people, you get Lil Baby, the Baby, Rick Ross, like Kyrie Irving, like all of these people. Um, and then from there, we was posting content every day, three to five pieces a day, every single day for <laughs> years. And then um, lastly, it was like going in person. So I always say it's like, if you want to get your first sale, like go to where your customers are. So for us, we knew that tens of thousands of our customers were at every single HBCU game, every single HBCU homecoming, every single HBCU spring fest. So we just went and set up shop at every one and we'd make a ton of money. And that also helped like humanize the brand a little bit too. So that was like the intricacies of the four things that we really did to start taking off. That's the cool part of about what your brand's done. And there's other online brands that do it, but there's a, the far majority don't. You guys, you, you use the word humanize, but I'll just simplify it to taking it offline. Right. Right. Uh, you can run ads, you can do all these things and sit in your room and make some money. But once you're able to take it offline and it becomes like a real world thing, those are the ones who truly have a brand. Yeah. Right. You're not just selling clothes through Shopify and making a good return. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But that's what I love about what y'all did. It was it was, it was a brand. So I, well, I want to get to what you think in terms of dropping I mean, um, like building a brand today and what that might look like mm -hmm. in merch today. But just tapping into a culture that already exists. Is that something that you tip, you kind of advise? Because that, that was your path, right? I don't right. Know, it wasn't like maybe super intentional. Yeah. But understanding that that was something that helped y'all grow the way y'all did. Right. Is that something that you say, oh, if you can, that's, that's what you need to do? Yeah. I, like, so the way that I look at it is there's a tons of different, like there's so many ways to make money, especially in this business in general, print on demand, drop shipping, doing it how we did it. It's more so of like what you're, I feel like what you're, you know, feel purposeful in mm -hmm. because for us, it was just like, I really felt bad. I was like, bro, I'm the first, like, I, no, no one in my family knew about this at all. Like, yeah. this needs to get out there. Mm -hmm. And that gave me kind of like the, you know, the push of like, if things got hard, then I wouldn't quit on it because it's something I actually cared about. Yeah. Whereas like, that doesn't typically happen. I actually posted about this today where I was like, most people that are starting brands and that are more new, they end up quitting very quickly because they don't have enough of like their mindset invested in the business like I did when I first started or they don't have enough money invested in it. Because when I first started, I had saved up like $10,000 and like two pennies from my job and then I invested all 10000 into the business and like immediately I was like, I didn't know how I was going to pay rent, didn't know how I was going to eat, like none of those things. But 
I couldn't quit now because I was so invested. Mm -hmm. So where most people are like, oh, I'm going to go to this free training or I'm going to go to this whatever and then try it out for three to six months. It doesn't work. And then they're like, oh, this new shiny thing's happening. Let me go try that out. And they just like stay in that perpetual cycle of like never making any true momentum. I did a little differently where I was like, bro, if this is what I'm feeling purposeful and passionate about, I'm going to just invest everything into it. And then I legitimately won't be able to quit because all of my eggs are in the basket. And then that was kind of like, like, so when I'm, when you're thinking about starting a brand in general, I think that's one of the biggest things that you can do. And I don't think that it's necessarily about cause or purpose or like, or excuse me, cause in general, but it's more so like, what do you feel purposeful about, you know, building a brand around? Mm. Dope, dope. And that's that's so important just because today we're the influencers, artists, obviously, you know, you talked with a lot of artists. To me, I look at merch as that extension, like the ones who do it best. And I, w I would actually like to know your thoughts or beyond what I'm about to say. But like one thing I always try to say is like, all right, if you could build something outside of just your face. Yeah. You know, a lot of people just want to throw their faces like, bro, you're, you're not anybody yet. You're right. somebody. But two people who don't know you, you're nobody. And why would I just put that on my yeah. you know, this random guy? So it's one of the biggest it's one of the biggest issues that new brand owners face. They think that like just because they came up with the logo or their face or whatever, that other people will want to buy it. It's just not true. So like I always venture very far off from like especially if we're talking about artists, like yeah, that's cool, bro. Like you're building a personal brand, but a personal brand has no enterprise value. So you're building up a personal brand based around your face. That's very difficult to sell and that's very difficult to exit because if you die or something happens or you get canceled, then the business is now no longer worth anything because it's attached to you. So whenever I'm talking to like new business owners, artists that want to do merch, whatever, I'm like, bro, build something outside of you but use your personality to direct attention to it and traffic to it but don't make it be about you build something that has you know scalability and is able to be exited because the real the real wealth is made when you build the brand and then when you exit it because until then you're just like holding on to something and mm -hmm. you don't make the money until you sell it so that's i love hard to sell hard to exit <laughs> like that's I mean, those are two of the hugest hurdles yeah. right there. Like, and cause that exit, I think, especially, I know just talking with a lot of family and friends, people don't realize a lot of times you don't make that money at all. Really? Yeah. You exit. Like you, you're making, you might build your business up in most businesses, right. Um, to making a good salary. Right. But it's like, yeah. All right, bro. You're an engineer at Microsoft. You're making just as much as me or, or maybe even more right. in many businesses. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Until I, 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 yes, I have this ownership and then I can sell out of it. And now all of a sudden, okay, I'm caked up or something right, like that. Right. But I think people have that misconception. And, I, and also it seems like people might not knowing that they might like kill the growth of their own business mm -hmm. because they're trying to pay themselves too much. So, Knowing what y'all did and what y'all accomplished, how did y'all, how did y'all look <laughs> at how we're investing in the business, yeah. <laughs> hire, reinvest, and how we pay ourselves? As do? <laughs> Looking back at it now, I mean, we probably just did it completely wrong. So, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you, but I was always the person that just lived drastically below my means. So, like, I, I bro, the peak that I paid myself was five k a month, and bro, we were doing between 700 to a million dollars a month, bro. So, and I was just paying myself 5k a month, um, which now looking back at it is good because we were able to invest a ton back into the business and build the brand up more quickly, but then also bad too, because when you're thinking about exiting a business, you have all of these, you know, you're taking on a bunch of the brunt of the work, but when you leave, you have like five positions that need to all be hired for. So when a company is looking at purchasing this business, they're like, well, we need to pay a fair market wage for all of these different positions that you are all doing. So the business actually isn't as profitable as you're making it seem because mm -hmm. more people have to be hired now that you're leaving. So um, I would say that, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I probably would extract more capital out of the business like while we were growing it. Not because I wanted to just pay myself more, but because when you're selling a business, they're going to be like, what's the EBITDA? Right. And then afterwards, it's like, all right. 
you have to, you can't just you can't just be like yo bro i wasn't paying myself nothing so now it's worth x amount of money this is just not true because someone has to take your position yeah. so i probably would have took more to pay myself a fair market wage to prep myself and the business for when we leave hey i was already paying myself a fair wage to cover all of these positions and we were still profitable take that money back and then go do what you need to do with it. It's still a good functioning business. Whereas what I was doing was just like, bro, pay me as little as possible, put it all back into the business and, you know, built a big brand, but didn't make much personal take home money. Yeah. So that's, that is a very great way to justify paying yourself more, but it, cause it all <laughs> makes sense. Like, yeah. like, and it really makes sense. And you know, Obviously, there are some people who pay themselves too much, but right. there is that side of it that, like, I I know I struggle with, like, when we start making money and things like that, and then you start realizing taxes, and right. it's like, hey, man, the government said, hey, bro, you can't just be paying yourself nothing. Right. You, know? like, <laughs> you aren't even allowed to not pay yourself as little as you right. try to take. So, like, it's, it's definitely an interesting paradigm switch. Let's get into, though, the, the more scandalous side of things, okay. you know, when you guys got hit with I think I had the let me read the headline oh, just yeah. for social media. <laughs> this ought to sake. be outstanding. <laughs> yeah. Is it is HBCU apparel brand support black colleges cheating its customers. <laughs> All right. That's one of the headlines. I'm not gonna go read anymore. Sure. But the whole story, obviously. Right. Um you guys sold I think it was like four million dollars worth of, uh -huh. of uh apparel and then people were upset about not getting it. Right. right. Now, I got my thoughts on the situation, sure. um, and I love how you guys have handled the situation, but I, I want you to kind of give your, your insight. Oh, man. First. Bro, it's super simple. Like, we just scaled way too fast. Yeah. Like, we scaled super fast, and then you haven't operated that level of a business yet, so you're making decisions that you think are the right decisions, when in reality, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So... Imagine going from, you know, we were doing well, but then you start doing 700, 800 million dollars a month. And then you're like, damn, bro, like we never had 15,000 orders before. How am I supposed to handle this? Naturally, you think, oh, let me go hire a bunch more people to help fix this problem. But then now you're putting out a lot more money. Then you're having to train more people. They're not doing the job correctly because they're new and you're trying to solve an issue with money. And then now looking back at it what i would have done was just spend a lot more time training the team that we already had that was already sufficient to like just streamline our processes more that we already had and so you know more of the story bro was we made bad decisions we scaled too fast we were young operators of the business and made the wrong decisions on trying to fix the problem and then afterwards we just took all the accountability and that's what we said is like hey we did it wrong and now we're just trying to fix the issue that that was it. The interesting part is, you know, y'all got scam thrown at y'all, right? Oh uh, yeah. And you know, one we got to define what an actual scam was. Like being late on orders, right, is not a scam. Yeah. Um, it is a problem that many people uh, run into who are handling a real inventory business, right? And it's so funny like, when I saw this because I remember being younger, and when I first started learning about businesses that went out of business yeah. because of too much demand. Yeah. It didn't make sense to me. I'm right. like, P people want your product and you go out of business because too many people want your product. <laughs> and this was like somewhere in right, that, right. that space where you hit that dangerous level. Um, it, where are the, what's the, the worst threat to a business in that moment? Is it just a brand hit or is it because like, supplier relationships yeah. that become an issue like what is it oh man the biggest no-no during that is to have a big ego bro that's the worst thing you can do and that's like the exact opposite of what i did gratefully because once we made that money the first thing that i did is i went out and found a consultant and he was like the ex-vice president uh, or ex-president of coach and like the ex-president of steve madden and i was like bro what do i do because if i have to do it myself it's gonna t i'll be able to figure it out but it might take like three to five years mm -hmm. because this is my first time doing it and bro like i'm 20 you know whatever trying to figure this thing out doing millions of dollars i'm like bro i don't know what's going on and then he was like so i started paying him a hefty salary a month 
to just teach me what I would have learned in three to five years to teach me in three to five months so I can solve this problem. So I think the biggest thing that you can do wrong in that space is have an ego. And I literally just had to like lay it all on the line because what I realized in that time period too was I was building, how do I explain this? I, I did it wrong. And I'm hoping that someone learns from this because what I did was I built a life around my business instead of building a business around the life that I wanted for myself. So I was looking at like Instagram and like, oh, how do like clothing brand owners like, you know, what do they do? And oh, I want a big warehouse so like I can look cool and like all of this stuff. And I thought that that was the right thing to do. But in reality, what I should have did was what type of entrepreneur am I? What type of entrepreneur do I want to be? And what business model fits around the lifestyle that I want for myself. Whereas what I was doing didn't fit because I'm not the operations guy. Like that wasn't my, that wasn't my strong suit. That's why I had to hire somebody to teach me. But if I would have just stayed in my strong position or like in my zone of genius of marketing, branding, traffic, customer service, then I would have never ran into that issue that I had in general. So the biggest thing, and bro, it's difficult to do that where it's like we had 30 employees and then we like run out of money, and but you're doing a lot of money and then you run out of money. And then I'm just like, all right, I need now I need to like hire someone to help me fix this problem. So I hire someone to help me fix this problem. We go from 30 employees to three employees because we couldn't pay anybody. And then because so you can imagine like what, what that does to your ego and stuff. So that just to answer your question more streamlined is like the worst thing that you can do in business, especially during times of like, you know, struggle is like to have an ego. By far. Yeah, I, like, I think it's like Sean said, the biggest thing is to get humanized, right? Because people attack businesses, but if you like, yo, I'm a person, I fucked up. They're like, yeah, right, we can get that. You yeah, know? and I mean, <laughs> and then even when, like, the Shade Room wanted to, like, reach out and do a, a story on it, I'm like, yeah, bro. Like, it was a very easy conversation because I was like, hey, got a bunch of orders, never been in that position before. We're sorry. We're trying to fix it. I mean, that's the bare bones of what it was. So the like the accusation and assumption is you guys just kept selling, kept selling, kept selling and didn't have any kind of inventory. Was it that or I mean, you talked about training like, or like did you or the, did the inventory come slower than you expected? Oh, what, yeah. What did that look like? It was a ton of stuff like that. So in these types of businesses, you just got so many moving parts. So it's like you got a lot, lot of inventory, but then you tell a manufacturer like, yo, Black Friday's coming up. I need to have X amount of inventory by this date so it can make it to customers by this time. They might say, yeah, I got you, like whatever. But then something happens on their back end where, oh, the fabric didn't come or this and that didn't come. You already started selling based on the promise that they made you. And then now it's pushed back and the timeline's pushed back. So now you have no choice but to deliver the product late. But then people aren't going to not be mad because, you know, mm -hmm. you're because the supply chain was messed up so at that point it was like we made a promise that we honestly felt like we can keep based on what a manufacturer told us which i still take accountability for because i should have more thoroughly vetted the situation and like all of those things so it's not even their fault it's still my fault and then they um they don't deliver on their promise and then you still got to face the customer so i think it was a, a bit of that it was n uh, number one not knowing how to operate at that scale just yet number two uh, other pieces of the puzzle that were uncontrollable. And then number three, afterwards, it just taking too long to figure out and solve the problem because it was our first time doing it. And then now you get into people are mad because it's like months and months are going by and you're actively trying to fix the problem every day, but trying to do it for 15,000 people is not something that you can just do like in a week or two or even a month. So it was a combination of all those things. Man, if anything, you know, you sold something real and y'all sold a lot of money's worth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of people out here who are teaching or they speak on things and then they're like, man, they, they really did. Did they ever really build a business? You did <laughs> build and sell. Right. right? Like it's, it's a different thing to get in trouble for, uh, where basically, Hey, I did this too well. And right. then I just couldn't figure out how to right. handle the back end. Right. Do you consider yourself a good operator now? Yeah. Now, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's just like when you're doing something for the first time yeah. ever, it's like 
if I went to go, if I never rode a bike before, I'm not going to think, oh, right when I hop on this bike, I'm going to be doing tricks. Like, it would be very unreasonable to think so. So for me to be my first time doing business, it would be very unreasonable for me to think that I'm going to know operations from top to bottom. I just didn't. But at least I was willing to put my ego down and then pay the right people to help me out. And then now I feel like I can operate a business much easier, which now, as you, as we talked about before, exiting the business and then now was able to build another business to multiple seven figures in a year rather than three, because I know all of the pitfalls that I already had went through. So Mm -hmm. I was able to stack those skills up and just very quickly turn it on and then not have to worry about the issues of fulfillment now, because I know how to handle them moving forward. What year was that by the way? 2020, 2021? Yeah. So yeah. We already know some additional issues. Oh, some, come on, man. Some supply chain issues. Bro, what? That time. Come on, man. Hey, man. It took me <laughs> it took me eight months to get a couch, man. <laughs> so, And I was one of those pissed customers because my Bro. wife was pregnant. And so we had just nothing in the living room. We had just moved. Come on, man. So it was, yeah, you know. And, and then, <laughs> and and then you got to. New business. Bro, so and then you got to add on the fact of like. So, bro, and I promise you, I take nothing but accountability for this. It's all my (laughs) fault. I promise you it is. I'm just going to take blame for it all. But, like, then you add on, you know, you got people like um, like an Elon Musk. Respect him, of course. Great businessman. But he's saying, oh, the Tesla Roadster is going to come out in 2023. I'm going to take all your pre-sale money up front. 2033 roll around, no Tesla Roadster around. Oh, we're projecting it to come around 2024, 2025 now. Bro, folks ain't putting Elon Musk in a Facebook group and tra- calling the shade room and this and that. It's like, bro, you know, yeah. it's a lot of that going on, too. But it, it, it's all a part of the game. But I'm just putting that out there to put in perspective of like um, to some of the stuff that we were going through, too, that doesn't happen to other people and not targeting Elon Musk for being like white or black or whatever. But it's just like when you think about it at scale like that, it's like this is happening on all of the realms from low level to high level, but it's just handled differently amongst like the customers that they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Let's take a quick second to talk about the elephant in the room. If you're an artist trying to grow, we already know what your goal is. A thousand true fans. Everybody talks about it, but how do you actually make that happen? How do you get those fans? It's not just about getting views. You got to push people further down the funnel. So let's talk about it. Number one, do you have these people's data? Right. Do you have the ability to text and build highly engaging relationships with these people? Can you boost your Spotify plays to actually have engaged users, not those surface level playlisting plays? Well, guess what? Fever Fan is a platform that allows you to do all of those things in one. So it's not overwhelming. You don't have to switch and have all these different logins and switch all your link in bios. You have even a link in bio tool that you can do. So everything is done in one place. So not only do you grow your fans, you do it for less work. How about that? Check out foreverfanmusic.com because we know it's not about views for the day. It's about getting fans who will be there forever. Foreverfanmusic.com. Let's get back to this video. I want to get your thoughts on today. Mm -hmm. If you're starting a merch brand, what would that look like from get-go? First things first is I always tell people to just operate with self-awareness. Like, please don't do what I did. I had 10000 bucks invested it all into inventory. Probably the biggest mistake that I made. Well, luckily, it pushed me to, like, do well. But as of right now, you can stand up a Shopify store with mock-ups, doing print-on-demand or doing drop shipping, and just making organic content and not having to spend any money at all. So if I was starting a merch brand all over again, I would... Number one, build a website on Shopify, free trial to do that. Number two, grab a couple of homies and get a sample from China. There's a ton of manufacturers all over my page on who can get samples done. That'll cost you like 75 bucks, 100 bucks. Get all of the homies to do a photo shoot and a video shoot and put all the product shots online and then start marketing organically on TikTok because... You, you make three to five TikToks a day in 30 to 90 days is no way you don't make sales if you just post organically on TikTok. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as long as you have a, a somewhat decent product. Post what on TikTok? So what I do is I go to the TikTok, go to the search, and then I type in like whatever my niche is. And then I just filter it by last three months, most liked uh, posts. And then I see all of the posts that have been going viral in my niche. Because I always say it's like, it's okay to be a copycat as long as you're copying the right cat. So I just look at what's going viral. And then I'm like, all right, this is already going viral. Don't let me try to like 
innovate and recreate the wheel, especially when I'm in a new business and all of my time and money is very valuable. Let me look at what's already working or go to the TikTok Creative Center or the Facebook ads library. What is Nike and Adidas and all of these brands doing? And then gather up me and my homies, but put our own spin on it and make it our make it work for us. And then post that piece, those pieces of content every day for however long that you can. That's that's what I would be doing. And that's what like. Bro, that's it's. Bro, I'm seeing too many people kill it, bro. It's crazy. Like, one of my students, he was like, he posted three. He went on TikTok and did that play. Found three posts. He posted three posts. His first post got 800 likes. I mean, 800 views. His second one got 8,000. His third one got 800,000. He made 70k in seven days from one organic post on TikTok. No that's Facebook right. ads at all. Right. And then now he has enough capital to be like, all right, let me try Facebook and Instagram and TikTok ads and all of this thing because now he has content that has already verified itself as it works organically so naturally put more money behind what's already working whereas most people are trying to come out the gate spending all of their money they got to start the business up on facebook instagram tiktok ads and inventory whereas you can just get no facebook ads no in to in tiktok or instagram no inventory put a mock-up on a decent website and then make content for free and then make a ton of money and then be like oh these five pieces of content work. Let me put money behind those since they already did well for me organically. And that's how I like kind of restructured the model, especially if I was just starting out now. I love that because it literally sounds exactly like what we tell artists except yeah, for the music. Yeah. For the oh, music. really? It's yeah. exactly it. We say, <laughs> Why are you wasting money pushing songs that you don't know of if they're going to hit yet? It's, mm -hmm. it's all organic content, post, mm -hmm. post, post, because it can go crazy on TikTok. We have people... Like we now literally have amounted to hundreds of millions of streams just off of organic content. Nice. Of the people we've advised. And it's like, oh, now that this one's working, now you can boost it. Yeah. Now you can get this one posted over on exactly. Instagram somewhere. Now, you know, and, and you can have other people copy. Sometimes it'll be a trend or, you know, right. different, different little things. So it, it's crazy to, I mean, to hear that from another industry but it, of course it makes sense. right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it's makes the same. sense because that's bro i was talking to my homie about it uh the one that we were talking about earlier and i was like bro if i'm an artist right now i'm making first of all i'm just sitting in my room all day making music then after i make a song i'm re recording endless tiktoks on it and different you know performance or whatever then i'm posting three to five times a day on tiktok and then if a song does well and it hits like maybe on the 17th day i'm like all right bet I'm going to take that song and then I'm going <laughs> to put money behind it. And then if the money behind it does well, then I'll invest into a music video. Like, yes. I feel like folks is going yeah. backwards. Yeah. They're like, oh, I made this song yesterday. Let's put all of our money into marketing and a music video. And I'm like, bro, you don't even know if that song going to hit yet. Exactly. So I was just thinking about it. if I was an artist, it's the same thing. I'll just be doing it in a little bit of a different way. But yeah, it exactly. seems like that's what y'all teach. That's like, exactly. That's play, bro. Yeah. That's the exact play. <laughs> 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 like, right there. You know what I'm saying? And that's the... I think that's the cool part of building a skill set, though. Just how you talked about, you went from one business, then you had, you start another business, and it grows quickly. Mm -hmm. Because once you start it, right. you know, again, you skip all the pitfalls, all the learning. Because I always say, especially as an entrepreneur, you, especially your first time around, you spend a lot of time undoing problems that you created, mm -hmm. right? And you start a new business, now you can just not create those problems in the first place right. and things move faster. Right. Right. So it's, it's dope to see that. But um, I know that you had something specific you want to ask about merch. So we're doing merch. Right? Oh, dope. Yeah, so, the, so much. Our first so, time yeah. around. <laughs> and I think it was, it was cool uh, for context for this interview, right? Right. Um, like we. We just wanted to do something for our community. Like, there's nothing like serious that we're scaling, but we think that, you know, it, it, the potential will probably be there. Right. Uh, but in those small little moments in the, in, the, in the details, you see, oh, shipping times and yeah. how all, all of this can become a problem. Right. right? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, I, again, I want to let you start, though, because I know you had some specific questions. You're deeper into it than I am. Yeah, man. So, first off, bro, your page has been a lot of help, man. Oh, like, man, man, I this appreciate last, that, what, bro. Been like, two months, a month or yeah. something, bro? Like, no, nah, your page, bro. That's like, what's up, bro. Yeah, but one thing I, I, I kind of got into, a, I guess, a, a conversation with a friend about is, like, how how much of, uh, how much importance did you put on, like, the small details of the merch, right? So, mm -hmm. things like custom tags. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess the better way to put it is, like, how much should you care about the experience of the merch right. 
versus like the actual merch. That's itself. a good question, bro. Yeah. And it's it's funny because it, it differs based on the type of brand that you have. So with Support Black College, bro, believe it or not, we were doing $4 million a year still with gilding tags and the hoodies. Like people don't care if you know how to market well. Mm -hmm. But when you have a good product, then it markets itself too. Yeah. So that's the thing about it is like product and marketing is kind of weird because a lot of people market because their product's not that good. But if your product's good, then it markets itself and you don't have to worry about marketing anymore. But then also, if you have a luxury brand, ain't no way you're going to get away with not yeah, having custom right. tags yeah. and whatnot. So I would say you kind of have to look at where you are on the spectrum from like, you know, just brand trying to get started, kind of come out the garage with it to if you're portraying yourself like a high end, like we're the next Louis Vuitton and da da da, you're gonna have to communicate that value to the customer. So I would say, <laughs> you know, if you're making that argument, for me, I always say, I should say that number one, it's not that important because we were able to make millions of dollars without it. Yeah. But that was for our type of brand. So I would just say, look at the spectrum of like, where are you landing from? Let's just say a, a support black college to a Louis Vuitton. And if you're more on the Louis Vuitton side, you're going to have to do that type of custom stuff because the value that the customer is going to be looking at is how do you, how well do the product shots look? Like, how can you communicate the dream outcome of what they get by wearing this brand? Because that's all these big brands do anyways. Yeah. They make you believe that this dream outcome that you're portraying of the lifestyle is actually achievable. Yeah. But the only way that you'd make it achievable in the clothing space is customer reviews, um, dope product shots, very, uh, very quality shots of the product, um, very quality like lifestyle images and whatnot. So Moral of the story is, look where you're at on the spectrum. If you're leaning more so on this side, it doesn't matter as much. If you're leaning more so on this side, I take it more seriously. But at the end of the day, it's not an excuse to not be able to make money because we made millions of dollars without having any custom tags. So I always just kind of lean back on that when people give pushback there, too. Yeah, I got you. That was, that was kind of the argument I was making with the homie. I'm like, man, you know, like, I mean, we had just went to a, um, I want to call it a store. It was like this store in Little Five Points okay. that... You know, they're knocking out their merch. They got the regular supplier tags on the back. So I'm like, man, they, I just watched them sell 40 hoodies. You know right. I mean? Like, nobody checked it and cared. But then, you know, like, we always talk about it. And, like, music is so much attention to details right, on that right. side. Like, that's the stuff that, like, the artist yeah. or the person cares about. So I was wondering, like, am I thinking too hard? You know what I'm saying? Nah, I think Thinking about it. But So do you feel like there's a price point where it makes sense to start? Things like, so I'm guessing, like, if, yeah. if you know a brand is starting out, let's say, I don't know. They're coming out with a hundred dollar hoodies, but not necessarily trying to be like luxury. You know yeah, what I'm does the experience still? Matter? I don't believe so. Anytime okay. you venture over like fifty, fifty five bucks for a garment, you're probably gonna want to be custom. Custom. Yeah, okay. I would say so. You like any like t shirt for twenty five bucks? You're not gonna get too many complaints about you know the yeah. tags being in there. Hoodie fifty bucks? Not really. But you start venturing over into that hundred dollar, hundred fifty plus. It's like all right. Now I feel like this is obviously more than what a regular hoodie would be. So I'm expecting some sort of experience now. Yeah. And it's crazy. I actually didn't realize how much people care about that type of stuff until somebody DM me the other day and was like, yo, are y'all going to have a, a care tag on the hoodie? I was like, like, like how to wash it? It was like, yeah. I was like, I don't know. I ain't think about it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's not, it, 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 no, I feel like it's that balance between trying to figure out like what are the customers just asking for just to ask for it? and then yeah. like like you said like what do they really care about right i feel like she might be the only person that's asked about that but yeah. it was very wild to me but i was like no we're gonna have to i didn't even know what that was like, do we need to put instructions on how to wash this thing? You <laughs> know what I'm in the bag <laughs> like to, to keep people happy but uh, yeah. i was thinking about that man so how do you go about picking i guess suppliers like mm -hmm. so I, I i guess i asked this way so we started out with Alibaba, you know, okay, yeah, off of recommendation, right? So out the gate, dealing with you know Chinese vendors, the right. time difference, things like that, but, right? Um, I've seen a lot of different arguments for you know finding different suppliers domestically, mm -hmm. like you know a lot of arguments for U.S. people faster times, things like right. that. But then you can't get away from how cheap it is. Exactly, you know what I'm saying? yeah. When you hit these other places. Like, right. what's your stance on, on yeah. the vendor, the vendor picking? Um, so I always have like a. A group of both of them in general so to be honest when you have a nice process streamlined around when merchandise is coming out it's easier for you to go overseas only because you know that if you're going to pay for like uh like overseas shipping like by the boat it's going to take like 30 45 days but the pricing is so cheap so mm -hmm. if you have a streamlined system on how you're rolling out product then it makes sense to get the cheaper price point because you have the time to be able to like 
have those conversations with manufacturers, et cetera. Yeah. But if you know, all right, I'm going to order this stuff, but it might not be here in time for maybe a pop-up shop that's coming up in a month that I maybe forgot about, it very much so helps to have a U.S.-based supplier that's just in your back pocket at all times where it's just like, hey, got this thing coming up in a month. China ain't going to be able to get that to you. So yeah. I need this in 14 days. I'm, and I'm willing to pay the price point to get it now because I know that I'm going to make this return in another, you know, another 14 days. So whenever I'm thinking about just suppliers in general, more than likely I'm in China and Pakistan, but also we have a very streamlined process of how we release product too. So if you're, if I'm new though, and I'm starting off, I'm probably going to China and Pakistan solely because a new business needs all of that money up front, like the savings from, you know, just negotiation. You're going to pay more in the United States. So I would probably start there and then more so move over into you, the United States if that's something that you care about speaking on. Like, oh, we're made and manufactured in the United States. And if you don't care, then that won't ever matter to you. The only thing that the U.S. has a benefit on, in my opinion, is obviously the language barrier is a lot easier to speak and then number two is um time frame but mm -hmm. if you communicate very well through your tech packs and they're very easy to understand to your chinese manufacturers you don't really need to talk at all anyways so um more of the story is have have both and I recommend newer people start overseas a lot cheaper and then always have someone in the background that's in the United States to get something done for you if you need it quickly. Because let's just say you got a drop coming up and your Chinese manufacturer say it's going to come at a certain time. Oh, X, Y, and Z happened in the supply chain. Cool. Joe from spot in Atlanta down the, down the way. I need this in 14 days, fam. Like, mm -hmm. let's let's get it done. And you always have that backup. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, I was wondering that. So, so it's not uncommon for, like, a brand to have, like, multiple supplies? No, for bro. Brand. I, I recommend okay. it. Bare minimum, have eight to ten. Eight to ten? Eight to ten in, in the tuck just in general. Because that's how you get your negotiations better, too. Because when, you, when you're talking to a manufacturer, especially overseas, it's like, I'm talking to a manufacturer, and I know personally that I want to be at X price point. Because... You want to have whatever margin it is that you're looking to have. I typically shoot for at least a two and a half or a three times margin or like three X on whatever I buy it for. I can sell it for three times as much. But most people, when they're getting into this business, they don't think even further than that. Because when you go further than that and you're talking to Urban Outfitters and, you know, DTLR and Jimmy, all, all of these places, they want a margin, too. So most people are thinking about the margin as it relates from the customer to them. But they're not thinking of themselves as the customer, too, because in the future, if you plan on scaling, you'll be the customer to Macy's or Macy's is your customer. So now I have to think of how can I negotiate with this vendor to where the vendor makes money? Urban Outfitters makes money and I make money, too. And they never think about that whole, you know, transition. Um, but so that's one thing. And then two, just having having multiple manufacturers in general, is just like a very, very safe thing to do, I would say. Like just in case one goes down. Just in case. Issues, okay. Just in case. Yeah. Like always keeping another one. I got a homie who's done some millions. Um, I mean, probably oh, tens of millions at this point in merch or whatever. And nice. He had he basically had one of those scenarios where the man, one of the main manufacturers, everything just crashed because he was they he was big in terms of what well, I would think. Oh, that's a good number. Y'all are doing well, but he was small in comparison to the rest of right. the manufacturers' customers, and they had whatever blockage or slowdown. And I think this was during the twenty twenty right there too. And he was low on the priority list, so he yeah. had to call. And they were doing like a uh, a Christmas sale that they do every uh, year, yeah. like for uh, for their artists. And so it's like, this is our time. This is where we make most right. of our money. Yeah. We need to be able to fulfill. And yeah, man, I, I I know he figured it out, but it sounded like he didn't already have right. a bunch of people in the tuck. Yeah, so got to. I, I I see how that yeah. how that works out. You got to. <laughs> it's vital. <laughs> yeah, because I know even what made me think about it was, um, I know, like I said, watching some of the videos on your page, and I was like, all right, you know, everybody, or it feels like everybody kind of starts off with, like, the basic t-shirt, hat, hoodie, right. is like the combo, right? But then as you grow and you start wanting to do more creative projects or mm -hmm. creative products, it's like, okay, I can't expect my Alibaba hoodie vendor to know how to create, like, a, a 3D model. You know what right, saying? So yeah. So I, I was already saying, like, man, if we want to do, like, X type of products in the future, like, we have to go find yeah. the people that specialize. And I'm learning, like, oh, there are people that, like, 
literally all they might do is like windbreakers or all they yeah. do is hats or all they do is you know, they right. kill it in that. So it's like, damn, if I want to sell nine different products, I might be working with nine different people who are bro. amazing at the thing that they're, bro, they're and, doing. Bro, if you even go like, you, a lot, even if it's a fine manufacturer sometimes, mm -hmm. like a lot of these uh, big retailers, they have to showcase their manufacturers because they are operating by like, you know, open whatever policy the manufacturers that we're working with don't do child labor and like all of these things. So if you just like even Google like Lululemon supplier list or Target supplier list, bro, they're working with hundreds of manufacturers, bro. Mm -hmm. So it's like, isn't if they if the big dogs are doing it why aren't why aren't we doing it as a startup business owner too yeah. so it's like bro i recommend at least eight to ten yeah that's I a fact it. that reminds me when i first kind of somewhat started to notice this type of thing was actually crocs i yeah. uh i was early when crocs started bursting because i like use it for sports right i, I after football practice and stuff just throwing crocs and shit <laughs> So I got real into them like early. I guess it was like 2009, 2010, whatever. Damn. But when I needed to get a new pair, I noticed it said Mexico. But the, I can't remember the first country it mm -hmm. said for yeah, it. was a completely yeah. different country. Right. And I was like, what? And then I got another pair and it said that other country. Yeah. So that started to make me realize. I'm like, man, I knew enough about general business concept. I only imagine that. Like, they must be growing, and right. they had to get, they like, had to, you know, different suppliers or whatever. Yeah, because I think they were made in Vietnam at first. Okay, yeah. I want to say, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, you just, you just you just notice that stuff. But it's cool to see, though, because in here you say this openly, obviously, because what you've done. Because I think we get tied into, like, thinking that that part's a finesse. Or something like that. Where it's like, no, this is just a business, right? right. You think that you're either overthinking it or you're doing <laughs> something wrong that you might not want somebody to do. Right. There's a lot of little things that become barriers when you're doing stuff for the first time. You don't know if it's okay or not. And that's one of those things where yeah. it's just like, all right, yeah, mm -hmm. day one, the negotiation benefit that you just said, the actual supplying for the customer. And oh, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Okay. I was trying to figure out what point I missed, but that's okay. the, the negotiation is because when you got eight to 10 vendors, that's what I always do. I'm like, hey, bro, I'm trying to be at $15 and then they're at 19. And I'm like, bro, this other person's doing it for 14. You either going to meet it or beat it or you not, bro. Yeah. Like there's hundreds of manufacturers on Alibaba. Are you going to do it or not? Yeah. And, and you have to be shrewd like that sometimes just to be able to. Because you're talking about negotiating a couple of dollars, but when Urban Outfitters put in a three, four hundred thousand dollar order, that's a difference of tens of thousands of dollars in profit if you yeah. don't do those negotiations. So having eight to ten and then even somewhat playing them against each other because like, yo, bro, so and so's running to do a fifteen. Can you match? Can you beat it? No? Cool. I'm cool off you. Hey, bro, so and so's doing it for fourteen. Can you and you can slowly work your price down, but you have to be mindful of there is a threshold of where if you negotiate too hard, because a lot of people negotiate too hard and they don't realize that you're negotiating against yourself because the manufacturer is just going to take from your quality. And then you think you're saving money, but they're really stealing the money back in quality. So you have to be in that position where typically manufacturers are making 10 to 20 percent on any order. And their margins are really slim. So I like to be open with the manufacturers and be like, hey, I'm working with Urban Outfitters. They want 40 percent margins. I'm trying to be at X margin. And I know that you want to be at a 10 to 20 percent margin. How much does it cost you to make this stuff? Because I'm trying to make it make sense for all of us. And if we can't make it make sense together, I'm going to have to go somewhere else. And you're going to miss out on a $500,000 order. So, and then mind you, at, it might not be at scale for people that are just starting out. But at least you can kind of open your mind of how you can negotiate in these different, you know, conversations that you have with manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Dope. Okay. Dope. You, you said something that us too that I, I want to ask you about. Um, sure. It's a word I've heard a lot in the last week, but a tech pack. Yeah. What's a tech bag? Tech bag is basically like the conversation that you're having with the manufacturer about what your garment is. So it's going to show like the measurements of the garment, what you want the tags to look like, the fabrics and materials it's going to be made uh, made of, just um, pretty much a document showing what a garment is going to be. And you can send it to the main, a good tech pack, you can send it over to the manufacturer and they don't need to talk to you at all and they can get a sample made for you. Mm, so it's almost like a, I guess like a... Um like schematics. Kind yeah, it's like things. a, it's like a, let's just say if you're an architect, like, you know, it's like a blueprint. It's yeah. like a blueprint to making a good garment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I forgot this tech pack situation. <laughs> Bro, just go, on, <laughs> just go on Fiverr and like somebody for like 20 bucks would do a very nice one. 
Okay. You just you just communicate the idea that you want and sh- draw it up, and then they'll make it a tech pack for you. Okay. All right, yeah. but, but, but. And another trick you can do too is like, what when I'm sending stuff off to our suppliers, our manufacturers, a lot of people are like, "Damn, how do I get it to look like you know this piece of you know this garment or this piece of clothing that I like?" So what I do is like, if I want them to like match a color, I just cut a color like I cut a swatch out of like a hoodie that already matches the color that I want. And then I also, if I'm like, "Yo, I want the pockets to be like these Adidas sweats," I'll just send them a pair of my Adidas sweats. So if you got like a T-shirt that you really like the fit of, I'll just be like, "Yo." For this tech pack that I just sent you, make it like this T-shirt that I just sent you, but adjust X, Y, and Z. So now they don't have to guess about the measurements and all of these things. I just send them what I like, and I'm like, hey, I like this. Do that. And then they'll do it. So that helps out a lot. That actually sounds like it would have solved a couple of issues. <laughs> <laughs> that we was having is like, man, bro, it's a learning journey, man. Yeah, it's facts. It's a journey, bro. It's right. a journey. So I guess really um, the, the last thing I, I did want to ask is, like, is I, I noticed that with – a lot of brands starting off, t-shirt, hat, hoodie is like the, the trifecta right, mm-hmm. to get things going. But are there other products you've seen that, you know, maybe most people don't think about that you've seen either just mm-hmm. sell really well, have like high profit margins, be something people should think about? Yeah, I think the biggest thing when I'm thinking about product in general, especially right now, is two things. Number one, it just has to stand out in some way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. I think that you can get away with like garments haven't changed in hundreds of years, bro. Like yeah. hats, hoodies, T-shirts, shoes, like the silhouette of shoes have been the same forever. Yeah. So it's more so of like what can you do to make the product stand out a little bit more? Um, that's the bigger thing. And then number two, <laughs> it, like when you're doing business at the at the highest or at a high level, the collections that you drop are based on what the like what uh, urban outfitters will want. And typically the ratio that you see is like for every um, for every two tops you have, you have one bottom. So a lot of people are putting out these like different collections and it's like three hoodies, a letterman and like a pair of socks or whatever. But in reality, when you're rolling out a true collection, as it relates to like doing business with these companies, for every two tops that you have, you have one bottom. And that's how you can like actually build out a collection because they're going to want what's called a line sheet. And when you have a line sheet, that's basically showing all of the things that you have in stock, all of the colors that it comes in, all of the SKU numbers for everything so they can actually make an order. And I remember sending a line sheet over to like Macy's or something. And they were like, bro, like you got like five pair of shorts and two T-shirts. Like, what is this? So I was like, what do y'all want? And then they told me that like kind of ratio that they go for. So um, uh, products, though, that stand out. Typically what I do is. I just make sure I'm following that ratio. Yeah. Um, and then also having a uh, a product on, like let's just say a collection that I'm coming out with is like two hoodies or four hoodies, two pair of shorts and like, you know, maybe some socks. Two of the hoodies will be something that is a little bit more difficult to execute, maybe like a cut and sew piece, and I can charge more for it. The other ones might be like a decent design, and then that last one might be something like logo basic, and it's much cheaper. So now that you have four pieces, you're not leaving out any of your customers because the stuff that's more difficult will appear, appeal to the customers that are bigger or more you know, high-ticket buyers. The lower-end stuff will appeal to the people that are more lower-end, but that's typically how I would build out a collection where some stuff's for the high buyers, some stuff's for the low buyers, but making sure the ratio that I have is something that I can present to a big box retailer and they can understand too because that's typically how, how they buy. Mm. So, we were, so we were looking at um, like the, our order sheet earlier and I was, I was telling Sean that like I, it started to kind of look like one of our items. I don't want to say what it is, but <laughs> one of the items I almost feel like would be better off being used to try to like upsell people to mm-hmm. like let's say something more expensive like hoodies or whatever we come out with sure. and it makes me wonder like are, are like do you price things in a, in a like do you get an <laughs> item where you're like hey look, I know the, the profit margins are going to be slim here so rather than me try to sell a thousand of these let me see if I can try to get a thousand of these people to also buy like a hat or something like, right. is, that like a, is that like a is that common I it's, guess it's, for. it's pretty common I think even in like big business too like when you have you know something they call like a loss leader you know like yeah. you know like oh I know I'm gonna lose money on the toilet paper but I'll make money back on the baby formula or something like that um you know that happens and clothes, you can kind of get away with it a little bit, you know, a little bit more in more cool ways because you can be like, hey, I'm going to give a free T-shirt away or like a $5 T-shirt away, but it costs you $3 for the shirt. 
a dollar for the one color print and then you ship it for like five bucks but you charge ten dollars or eight dollars for shipping so you can like make two dollars on the shipping and make one dollar on the shirt but it looks like you're doing a crazy five dollar t-shirt sale but then everything else that you bring in is or everything else in on the site is like higher price stuff so you lead people to the site with this lower item that you actually still make money on but then they see everything else that you have then other ways you can do it too like a lot of people when i'm telling telling people like boost their average order value is they're not doing what you're talking about which is like upselling downselling cross-selling all of those things so that's something that like the first thing i put in place whenever i'm like looking at a business especially if they're doing like 5, 10, 50K a month, I'm like, all right, are you doing any post-purchase, you know, upsells and downsells? And most of the time they're not. So it's like, you just sold someone this black hoodie, then that's all that they bought. But then afterwards, you show them a a post-purchase upsell. That's a Letterman jacket that matches the black hoodie that they just bought. And you're giving them a 10% discount if they take action within the next 12 minutes or something. So now you can increase the average order value from just a $50 hoodie to a $170 order. And now you can spend more money on the front end because you acquired a customer and then they spent more. Whereas if you acquire or if you you know, making fifty dollars per customer and it's costing you twenty, thirty, forty dollars to acquire the customer, there's not a lot of spread. But if you're at like seventy, eighty, ninety dollars lifetime value on the customer, then you can spend a lot more on the front end. And that's how you can kind of beat the competition out because these newer people don't even know how to spend money properly in general. So if you can make more money per customer, you can outspend them to where they can't even like compete with you in the space too. So, you know, that's just you're right. And that's something that we do do. But yeah, so you're on the right track. <laughs> Shit, be crazy. I'm telling y'all, man. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, man. Sure. Corey was playing a clip before you got here. This was a short IG clip he had came across where you were saying that there was a mistake in making the business your identity, right? Mm-hmm. And I had literally just watched a clip. We were doing this podcast on mental health uh, for artists. That hasn't come out yet, y'all. It'll come out eventually. <laughs> but, <laughs> and the artist was actually saying he had made a mistake of putting his identity in his projects. Yeah. Every time he finished creating his project, um, you know, he just felt depressed, right? Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that means what, it meant the same thing for you. Mm-hmm. But there's always this concept of wrapping yourself in or, or identifying yourself in right. whatever you're working on. What did you mean in terms of, you know, identifying yourself with the business yeah. and then what was the pitfall of what you were saying? Yeah. So, you know, years ago, we came to a place where there was $12,000 in our business bank account, but our payroll was $12,600. So I had to come out of pocket 600 just to meet payroll. And mind you, we was doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month at that time, like, you know, years ago, whatever. And I was just like, bro, how... I don't I didn't have the traits to manage money properly. That's what it all boiled down to. But at the end of the day, we got to zero dollars in the bank account. And then I'm just like, damn, bro, like, what does that mean about me? You know, like, what does that mean about me as a businessman? What does that mean about, you know, me as a person or whatever? And I remember hitting zero dollars in the account and being like, all right, I'm about to have to go on Instagram, call my mom, like hit everybody up and be like, hey. We are out of business. And then I just was taking a shower one day and then or that same night and I was taking a shower and then I was just like asking myself, like, yes, this business did well. Yes, you were the one that, you know, built the business. But who are you without it? Because it's about to be gone tomorrow if you don't figure something out. So you better very quickly figure out who you are without this thing, because this business is not your identity. And I was like, wow, that was very powerful for me to realize because I was like, the, the thing that really mattered most was the character traits, the relationships, the belief systems, and the skill sets that I acquired from the business, not what the business made me look like or how it made me feel when it was successful. Because if you attach your ego or, you know, your identity to the business or the music or whatever, as it goes up and down, so will your emotions and whatnot versus how I look at it now is what skill sets, belief systems, character traits am I missing that is not allowing this thing to produce the result that I want? 
has nothing to do with who I am as a person, but has everything to do with like the skills that I'm lacking or whatnot. So for me, that process was being in the shower, being made millions of dollars, then lost it all. And then being like, you don't have it anymore. Who are you? And then I was like, oh, I'm still a great person. Like my parents still love me. Like I'm a good guy. I have good character traits, relationships, whatever. And then that really made me go back into myself and be like, all right, well, if you are that person, then figure out a, a way to make this work. And then the next day, I found somebody to give us a loan for like $100,000. And then we just went after it and then turned the business all the way around. But it was because I had to like detach myself and my identity from the business. So now when I look at it, I just look at this business is a thing that needs inputs and then you're going to get outputs. You put the wrong inputs in, you get the wrong outputs. You put the right ones in, you get the right outputs. So I was like, all right. What output inputs do I need to put, put into this business to make it be successful? And even if I do it wrong, then that just means that I did something wrong, not I'm a wrong person or I'm a bad person. And that was a, a big shift that I had to make because a lot of people just end up tying themselves and their egos and their pride into these businesses and then and careers and then everything falls. And then they're left like I'm nothing now because, you know, this wasn't successful when in reality you just didn't put the right thing into it that it needed. And that's fine because you can figure that out if you take the time to do it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great way to end this talk. <laughs> Appreciate you stopping by. Appreciate man, for you. Y'all go check out Justin. Justin P. That is. Yeah. I am Brandman Sean. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.